Okay, so this new magazine that I got the other day in the mail is for April, May of 2021. Can you believe that we're thinking of April and May already? I mean, that's ridiculous. Okay, this is Strawberry Galette. Looking for a simple spring dessert with an outsized flavor and impact. Read on. Now you're going to make, let's see, the dough and you're going to make the actual filling that goes inside the dough. So this is quite complicated. And if I was talented enough, I would try this, but I'm not that talented enough. This is by Matthew Fairman, and it's on Cook's Country, April, May, 2021, page 10. It says, although strawberries are delightful eaten out of hand, especially at the peak of ripeness in late spring, they become something truly sublime when baked into a dessert. Their flavor concentrates and intensifies as the liquid inside them cooks off. My go-to fresh dessert is always a free-form galette. It's everything that lovable about pie, but with less fuss. As with any baked fresh fruit filling, the juiciness of the fruit can cause some structural problems if left unchecked. This is especially so with strawberries, which seem to have a hitting reservoir of the ruby juice within them. It's all too easy to toss some strawberries with a bit of sugar, place them in a pastry, and slide it all in the oven and then come back to check come back to a strawberry lake overflowing the soggy shores of the crust. For this recipe, I made a few decisions, so guard yourself against the truly disappointing outcome. First, to ensure a uniformly sturdy, flaky crust, rather than a short, crumbly one that might leak. I turned to a method called frissage. It's a technique I encountered when making quiches and free-formed caramelized onion tarts for a French bakery. This is the process of working the crumbles of flour, butter, and water together into a dough by smearing them against the counter with the heel of your hand, thereby spreading the butter pieces into the thin sheets between the layers of flour and water. It makes for a sturdy, flaky crust. Second, after hauling and slicing the strawberries, I toss them with one-fourth cup of sugar, just enough to accent the natural sweetness and mellow some of their tartness. And then you let them sit for a while. My pa pastry dough is, will be chilled. Then I drain off the juice, reserving some to brush back onto the formed galette to help my final sprinkling of sugar stick. Less juice in the galette means less chance of leaking. Finally, just before placing the fruit on the rolled out pastry crust, I stir the berries together with a bit of strawberry jam, one and one half tablespoons of cornstarch. The jam not only added strawberry flavor, but along with the cornstarch, also helped thicken the juice, creating a leak proof form tart from the juicy, jammy strawberry filling. Now, they have tricks for a great galette with actual pictures that I wish I could show you. Uh, one, it says smear the butter into the dough to help make flaky layers. Number two, macronate, that's M-A-C-E-R-A-T-E, -E, the strawberries and the sugar to draw out excess moisture. On the third step, combine drained strawberries with jam and cornstarch to make a thick filling. Four, Firmly pleat the edges of the filled galette to contain the filling. Now, to make your strawberry galette, which will serve six people, your total time is 2 hours and 25 minutes, plus 40 minutes for cooling. Now, you're going to quarter any strawberries larger than a ping pong ball. Do not combine the macerated strawberries with the jam mixture until you're ready to form and bake the galette. They may release more juice and make it hard to shape the dough around the fruit. You're going to serve with tangy whipped cream if desired, which now I'm going to read you the tangy whipped cream, which serves six people and makes two cups. Total time, six minutes. I like that. One cup of heavy cream chilled. One fourth cup sour cream chilled. One fourth cup packed that's one and three-fourth ounces of light brown sugar, one half teaspoon vanilla extract using your stand mixer, fitted with the whisk attachment. 
You're going to whip all the ingredients on medium to low speed until foamy for about one minute. Now you're going to increase the speed to high and whip until soft peaks form. That takes anywhere from one to three minutes and then you can serve your tangy whipped cream. Back to the strawberry galette. For the dough, you're going to need one and one half cups, seven and one half ounces of all-purpose flour. And then you're also going to need one half teaspoon table salt. Then 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter because you're going to cut into one half inch cubes and chill. Then you want six tablespoons of ice water. Now for the filling, you want to have one and one half pounds of strawberries hauled some halved if small or quartered if large that makes five cups. Now you're going to need one fourth cup which is one and three fourth ounces plus one tablespoon sugar divided. Then you're going to need one third cup strawberry jam and also one and one half tablespoon of cornstarch, one fourth teaspoon of table sauce, table salt, sorry, table salt, one fourth teaspoon of table salt. Okay, now back to for the dough. Process the flour and salt in a food processor until combined. This takes about three seconds. Scatter the butter over the top and pulse until the mixture resembles coarse sand and butter pieces are the size of small peas. This takes about ten pulses. Add the ice water to the flour mixture and pulse until the dough begins to form into small curds and hold together when pinched with your fingers. About five pulses. Now here comes the second step for the dough. Transfer the mixture to lightly floured counter. Using bench scraper, gather dough into rough rectangular mounds about 12 inches long and 4 inches wide. Starting at the farthest end, use the heel of your hand to smear the small amount of dough against the counter pushing firmly down and away from you to create separate pile dough. Flattened pieces of dough should look shaggy. Continue this process all through the dough has been worked. You're going to gather the dough into roughly 12 by 4 inch mound and repeat the smearing process. Now the third step. Form your dough into 6 inch disc. Wrap tightly in the plastic wrap. Refrigerate for at least one hour or up to two days. You want to wrap your dough so it can be frozen for up to one month. If frozen, let the dough thaw completely on the counter before you roll it out. Now for your filling of the strawberry galette. One hour before rolling out the dough, toss your strawberries, which is one with one fourth cup sugar in the bowl. Now you're going to set that aside for one hour. Reserve one tablespoon of strawberry juice. Drain the strawberries in a colander in the sink. Leave the strawberries in the colander while you're rolling out the dough. Now for the next step for the filling. Adjust the rack to the lower middle position and heat your oven to 375 degrees. Line a rimmed baking sheet with parchment paper. Roll the dough into 12 inch circles on the lightly floured counter. Then transfer to prepared sheet. Cover the dough loosely with plastic and refrigerate until firm about 10 minutes. Whisk your jam cornstarch and salt in a large bowl until combined and add strawberries and toss gently to coat. Mound your fruit in a center of dough leaving two inch borders. Carefully grasp one edge of dough and fold up two inches over the fruit. Repeat around the circumference of the galette Achoo! and sneeze. Achoo! Excuse me. Oh, goodness. Overlapping dough every two inches. Firmly pinch pleated dough to secure, but do not press the dough into the fruit. Now you're going to brush the top of the dough with the reserved strawberry juice. Achoo! I don't know why I do this. Achoo! And sprinkle dough and filling with the remaining one tablespoon of sugar. Now the final step for the galette. Bake the crust until deeply golden brown and the fruit is bubbling. One hour to one hour and ten minutes. Let the galette cool on a baking sheet for ten minutes. 
Use parchment. Carefully slide the galette onto a wire rack. Remove the parchment and let cool on rack until just warm for about 30 minutes. Then you're going to serve. And that's on page 11. Moving forward. I apologize. Oh. My allergies. They do not love me tonight. Okay. For all the mac and cheese lovers out there, they had an interesting recipe here. Cheeseburger mac and cheese. It's a perfect marriage on the stovetop by Mark Hexlaw. And uh, they show a picture here where it says Spark sprinkling the extra cheese and broiling gives the me me meaty mac lots of flavorful browning. And it says for burger flavors, what makes our version of one pan macaroni and cheese taste like cheeseburgers? Aside from the ground beef, it's the roaster of the savory burger toppings, chopped onion and pickles, ketchup, mustard, Worcester sauce, sharp cheddar, and meaty, gooey American cheese. You want to make sure that your beef is well brown beef. Don't just cook it the pink out and smear the beef on to get that color, thus the deepest the flavor. Oh, goodness. My allergies are saying stop, but I want to get this done. <laughs> when I was a kid, no meal was ever made as happy as macaroni and cheese did. As an adult, I still hold a place in my heart for mac and cheese alongside one of the other all-time favorites, cheeseburgers. I set out to combine the two in a one-pot meal. Started by cooking ground beef in a 12-inch skillet. I added a pound of it. Covered until the pasta was al dente, and then I folded it in a shredded cheese to uh, melt it. Finally, I sprinkled over the cheese and broiled it all for a brown top. It's a bit of a mess, but the skillet couldn't contain all the pasta, and the dish yielded too much food to make it a little more manageable. I cut uh, back to half a pound of pasta. This was easier to maneuver and produced plenty for four to six dinners. But the dish was still suffered from pebbly beef and a shortage of cheeseburger flavor, so I had ideas. To close the flavor gap, I made sure to get a solid sear on the ground beef to emulate that beloved burger crust. One potential side effect of browning the pebbly meat, so I turned to a test kitchen trick and soaked the ground beef in a solution of salt, water, and baking soda for 15 minutes before searing it. This kept things tender. I also added onion to the skillet to soften before the pasta. Now, after experimenting with several sharp cheddar for the flavor and metabolicity, half the fun of a good cheeseburger in the toppings, so I stirred in ketchup, mustard, and chopped dill pickles. Switching to raw onion instead of cooked gave me a familiar sharp flavor, and I love it on burgers. Finally, a tablespoon of Worcester sauce bolstered with the overall meat meatiness. A younger version of myself would jump for joy, just like the current grown-up version. And this is page 16. Now, the cheeseburger mac itself serves four to six people. The total time is one hour. Tossing the beef with the baking soda solution in one step before making it tender. Now, here's what ingredients you need. i got to blow my nose again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay one and one half tablespoons plus one and one half cups of water divided one tablespoon of table salt divided one no let's start from the top shall we one and one and a half tablespoon plus one and a half cups of water divided one teaspoon of table salt divided one teaspoon of pepper, one half teaspoon of baking soda, one pound, 85% lean ground beef, I like that it's lean, one tablespoon of vegetable oil, eight ounces, two cups of elbow macaroni, and one cup of whole milk, we're not done yet, eight ounces of American cheese chopped, which is two cups divided, Eight ounces of sharp cheddar cheese shredded, two cups divided. One half cup finely chopped onion plus extra for serving. One fourth cup finely chopped dill pickle plus extra for serving. I like the pickle. 
two tablespoons of ketchup, two tablespoons of yellow mustard, one tablespoon of Worcester sauce. Now for the very first step, which there's five steps all together, you're going to stir the one and one half tablespoon water, the one and one half teaspoon of salt, pepper, and baking soda in a medium bowl until baking soda and salt are dissolved. Add beef and mix until thoroughly combined. Let it sit for 15 minutes. Your second step. Heat your oil in a 12-inch broiler safe filled skillet over medium high heat just until smoking. Now you're going to add your beef and cook, breaking up the meat with a wooden spoon until well browned, which takes 6 to 8 minutes. The third step. Add your macaroni, milk, and remaining 1, 1 and a half cup water. Bring it to a simmer. Cover. Reduce your heat to medium low. Cook until macaroni is al dente, which takes about 5 minutes, stirring halfway through the cooking. The fourth step. Adjust your oven rack 6 inches from the broiler element and heat broiler. Stir in 1 and a half cups of American cheese, one and a one half cups of cheddar, onion, pickles, ketchup, mustard, Worcestershire sauce, and remaining one half teaspoon of salt unto macaroni until fully combined and cheese is melted. It takes approximately two minutes. Off the heat, sprinkle remaining one half cup American cheese, remaining one half cup of cheddar over the top of the macaroni. Broil until spotty brown for about two minutes. Now you're going to let it cool for five minutes. Sprinkle with extra onions and pickles and serve. That sounded absolutely delicious. Oh, here we go. They mentioned this on the cover. Blueberry biscuits. Now, I love blueberries, so this automatically caught my attention. Why eat a blueberry muffin when you can have a fluffy, buttery blueberry biscuit instead? Now, this comes from... Uh, Morgan Boiling, but she also leaves a little note here for, about the American table. So let's read that. Prior to 1916, attempts to grow blueberries in home and commercial gardens had been unsuccessful. The reason? Blueberries do best in sandy, acidic soil, not soil typically used in gardening. But in 1910, Elizabeth Coleman White began experimenting in New Jersey's pine Barrens, where she found that many high bush blueberries, Vaccinian Corian Bosom varieties, not only thrive but also produce delicious berries that were easy to harvest and ship. Business boomed, and today many high bush berry varieties are grown in New Jersey, Michigan, Florida, and other states, as well as Chile and Peru. So called the quote unquote wild blueberries, also called the quote unquote low bush, are mainly grown in Maine and Canada. Bojangles, the southern fast food chain, has a menu uh, item that I used to love called Bowberry Biscuits. Now, these are breakfast treats that have a fluffy texture of a biscuit and sweetness of a muffin and are studded with something called Bowberries, which are fox blueberries. I haven't had these biscuits in many years, but I distinctly remember the quote-unquote berries didn't taste much like blueberries. To me, they tasted more like candy or part of a sweet breakfast cereal. I love them nonetheless. I've always had a sweet tooth and motivation of Bowberry biscuits got me in onto the door of many mornings throughout the middle school. Inspired of my memories, I set off to make the recipe for blueberry biscuits. I wanted to be careful to keep these in the realm of fluffy biscuits with light, tender texture with almost melts in your mouth. I was at, after the delicious, sweet, slightly salty flavor of the fast food biscuits, but of course I wanted to use real blueberries. I'm pretty sure that even our crack shopping team would have had a hard time finding bowberries. Here at Cook's Country, we know our way around a biscuit. I started pulling elements from a few of our existing recipes using a mix of all-purpose flour, baking powder, baking soda, and salt. And then I used my fingers to smash in some of the chilled butter, a step to give biscuits their other signature fluffy interior crumb. The large pieces of butter melt in the oven and produce stem that helps create light texture. Now finally, I fold in the tangy buttermilk, plenty of the fresh blueberries. It was at the time to roll out the dough and stamp out the biscuits, or was it? Our recipe for pat in the pan buttermelt biscuits, which came out June-July 2019, 
calls for the baking biscuits in an 8 inch square baking pan and cutting the biscuits into squares instead of circles. Yes, it's a different look from the traditional round shape, but this technique avoids dirtying the kitchen counter and rolling and stamping out our biscuits. And there is no need to re-roll the scraps, a step that can overwork the dough and lead tough biscuits. So I decided to use this technique, bake my first batch in a 450 degree oven. The texture was great, moist and fluffy, but the biscuits weren't sweet enough and the blueberries felt out of place. I added some sugar to the dough and turned it, lowered the oven temperature to prevent the biscuits from burning. Sugar encourages browning. And because the biscuits and I grew up on eating had a sweet glaze drizzled on them, I played around with a lemon glaze and a buttery melt glaze, but I Ultimately, I landed on brushing the hot biscuits with a slightly salted honey butter, which is easy and delicious. Turns out, a buttery blueberry biscuit is still strong motivation for me to get me out of bed in the morning. And without needing to clean up a floured counter or use of a processor, the recipe actually feels easy enough to pull off as a coffee brewing. Key techniques for our easy, fluffy blueberry biscuits. Add chilled blue... Blah, blah, blah. Add chilled butter to flour mixture and smash your butter between your fingertips into the flat irregular pieces. That's step one. Step two of the key technique, press your dough into the pan and then cut into nine equal squares and bench scraper before baking. Now your blueberry biscuits, which serves nine and it makes nine biscuits. Your total time is one and one half hours plus 15 minutes cooling. We prefer the flavor of fresh blueberries here, but you can also use seven and a half ounces or one and one half cup of frozen blueberries that have been thawed, drained, and then patted dry with paper towels. If you have leftover buttermilk, it can be frozen to ice cube trays, uh, transferred to zipper lock freezer bags, and then fr frozen for up to a month. Upon thawing, that when the whey and the milk solids will separate, simply whisk the buttermilk back together before using it. Now for the biscuits, this is what it takes. One tablespoon unsalted butter, and then it says that's melted, plus 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter cut into one half inch pieces and chilled. Three cups, which is 15 ounce, all purpose flour, one half cup, three and a half ounces of sugar, two teaspoons of baking powder, one half teaspoon baking soda, one and one four teaspoon table salt, seven and one half ounces with one and one half cups of blueberries, one and two thirds cups of buttermilk chilled. Now for your honey butter, this is totally different. So key all your biscuit ingredient to the side. For the honey butter, it's two steps here. You need two tablespoons of unsalted butter and one tablespoon of honey, pinch of table salt. Okay, three tops. Now to make your biscuits, so you've got all your ingredients for the biscuits. Adjust your oven to the middle position and heat the oven to 425 degrees. Brush the bottom and the sides of an eight inch square baking pan with melted butter. Now you're going to whisk your flour, sugar, baking powder, baking soda, and salt in a large bowl. Add chilled butter to the flour mixture and smash your butter between your fingertips into flat irregular pieces. Add blueberries and toss with flour mixture. Gently stir in the buttermilk until no dry pockets of flour remain. Now using a rubber spatula, this is your third step, transfer the dough to prepared pan and spread into layer and into corners of the pan using the bench scraper sprayed with vegetable oil spray. Cut your dough into nine equal squares, two cuts by two cuts, but do not separate. Bake until browned on the top paring knife inserted into the center biscuit comes out clean for 40 to 45 minutes. Now for the honey butter, because now we moved on to that. Meanwhile, combine your butter, honey, and salt in a small bowl and microwave until the butter is melted. This takes 30 seconds. Stir to combine and set aside. Your next step, remove the pan from the oven. Let the biscuits cool in the pan for five minutes. Turn your biscuits out onto the baking sheet, then reinvent the biscuits into a wire rack. Brush the top of the biscuits with honey butter. Use all of it. Let cool for 10 minutes. 
Using the serrated knife, cut the biscuits along the scored marks and then serve warm. That was page 22 and 23. Okay, moving forward. I think we have two more left or one more. We'll see here in a minute. Oh, goodness. I seen this and I have a slow cooker. And I love my slow cooker because I love to come up with different things that I can serve in it. Now, this one caught my attention. It's chicken and mashed potatoes. Tender chicken with crispy skin and mashed potatoes on the side. What's Not to Love by Lawman Johnson. Okay, I love a simple, perfect uh, meal of chicken and mashed potatoes, but I knew I'd love it even more if I could use my slow cooker. I choose versatile Yukon gold potatoes for the tender, buttery texture and rich flavor. Cooking potatoes in a slow cooker can be tricky since they never come to a sustained boil. Slicing the potatoes help ensure even cooking and adding a cup of boiling water give things a jump start. In the previous slow cooker mashed potato recipes, we recommended placing a sheet of parchment paper over the potatoes to help lock in the steam. My aha moment was using a chicken to pieces do the work of the parchment. Now, I decided to use chicken thighs because they were very flavorful, remaining tender even after the long cooking times. What's more, their size and shape make the perfect for shingling a top potatoes to wrap to help trap steam. While cooking the thighs fat rendered and they release their flavorful juices, the process of the potatoes were eager to catch. After a few hours, I had soft potatoes and tender chicken, but I wanted a crispy skin. So I carefully removed the thighs from the slow cooker, set them aside on a rim baking sheet to allow the skin to dry a bit. I found that lingering moisture interfered with my plan for crisping. As the thighs dried, I drained the potatoes in a colander and then returned them to the slow cooker and mashed them right where there was some sour cream for tangy flavor and extra creaminess. And plenty of butter for that well butter. So minced garlic added a little kick and sliced scallions woke it all up with a fresh verdant punch. My chicken was ready for crisping. I heated up a broiler, brushed the skin with a mixture of olive oil, fresh thyme, and salt, slid the thighs into the oven. It only took about 10 minutes. Under the broiler for chicken to achieve perfectly crispy golden brown skin while my potatoes stayed nice and hot in the cooker. Time for dinner. Now they show a picture of how to assemble your slow cooker. The picture shows that the potatoes soak up the chicken flavor as they cook. Note that only half the chicken has been placed in the illustration above and the chicken helps trap the steam to cook the potatoes through. Now for your slow cooker chicken with mashed potatoes which serves four people, total time is four and a half or four three fourths hours. Sorry about that. Wasn't looking closely enough. Be sure to use Yukon Gold or yellow potatoes here. Russet potatoes will discolor as they cook in a slow cooker. Broilers behave differently, hence five minute ranges in a broiling time in fi step five. Keep a close watch on the chicken as it broils. The skin can go from golden brown to burnt in just a few seconds. For accurate measurement of boiling water, bring a kettle of water to boil and then measure out the desired amount. For two pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes peeled and sliced one fourth inch flick, flick, thick, two and a half teaspoons table salt divided, one cup boiling water, eight to five ounce of, of bone in chicken thighs trimmed, one half teaspoon pepper, one half cup and, of half and half, one fourth cup of sour cream, four tablespoons of unsalted butter softened two garlic cloves minced, two scallions, green parts only, sliced thin, two tablespoons extra virgin olive oil, two teaspoons of minced fresh thyme. Now you're going to arrange the potatoes in an even layer in the bottom of your slow cooker. Sprinkle with one teaspoon salt and pour boiling water over the top. For the second step, pat your chicken dry with paper towels and sprinkle with one three-fourth teaspoon salt and pepper. Transfer the chicken to the slow cooker, skin side up on the top of the potatoes. Now you're going to cover until the chicken and potatoes are tender, which takes four to five hours on low. Your third step, set a wire rack and aluminum foil 
mind-rimmed baking sheet and spray vegetable oil and transfer your chicken to the prepared rack, skin side up and set aside. For the fourth step, drain potatoes in the colander and return to the slow cooker. Add half and half sour cream, butter and garlic and one half teaspoon of salt to potatoes in the slow cooker and then mash the potatoes with a potato masher until almost smooth. Now stir in your scallions and season with pepper to taste. You're gonna set your slow cooker now to warm and cover your potatoes until they're ready to serve. Now your fifth step, the final step. Adjust the oven rack six inches from the broiler element and heat the broiler. Combine oil, thyme, and remaining one-fourth teaspoon of salt in a small bowl. Brush your chicken skin with the oil mixture. You want to broil your chicken until the skin is golden brown. That takes five to ten minutes. You're going to serve with your potatoes. Okay. And we got one more recipe here it looks like. And then we'll hit the tips they give us. It's called Strawberry Compote. For the very best fruit flavor, keep it simple by Lawman Johnson. You can eat this with cake or cheese or just right out of the jar. It's fruit, it's sugar, and not much else. A great strawberry compote should be as easy and simple as that. But with so few ingredients, each one has to be treated with care. For my recipe, to be successful, clear strawberry flavor and plenty chunky consistency, I needed to dial in on three intertwined things, texture, taste, and time. For the jammy texture, I sought the type of uh, fruit was paramount. Convenient and consistent frozen berries work fine in so many recipes, but not here. Let's see, I lost my place. Frozen berries just lost their structural integrity and didn't deliver that chunky texture I was after. I had similar issues with strawberries that were too soft or had been bruised. Instead, I chose fresh, firm, smaller berries that were free from any bruises. These held up best and in the springtime is prime strawberry season. Next, taste. Without great flavor, nothing else mattered and the key to great flavor was balancing the ratio of sugar to fruit. My first experiment, based on existing recipes and that I had found while researching, were much too sweet for me. I wanted more berry flavor and less sweetness, so I went down on the sugar to achieve that balance that I sought. Finally, time cooking the berries too long left me with mush, so I decided to add some liquid to the saucepan, thinking the same steam would speed things up and keep the berries structure intact just enough. I tested fruit sugar, orange, and apple, but these additions obscured the strawberry flavor. I replaced the juice with water and strawberry flavor came through loud and clear, but now the sauce was way too loose. A little cornstarch saved the day with its thickness powers combining water over the heat before adding the berries helped dissolve the sugar for even distribution activated the cornstarch. Now since the sugar syrup mixture was so hot, my berries cooked more quickly, softening to the right texture without mushing out. They begin to soften just after five minutes. I transferred the compost to the bowl where the residual heat from the syrup mixture continued to gently cook over the strawberries. To further boost the fresh strawberry flavor, I stirred in a little lemon juice at the end and once the compost was completely cooled and it was ready to adorn the ice cream, cake, or whatever best cheese bread or cheese board. Okay, now they have very precise constructions. They show step by step what you should do before I read this over here about what you need and all that. The first thing it says in a saucepan, you're going to whisk your water into a sugar cornstarch salt mixture. The next thing it says, you're going to stir in your strawberries and cook over medium heat until the mixture thickens. Then you're going to immediately transfer the compost to a bowl. You're going to stir in your lemon juice and let cool completely. So here's the what it takes. Serves eight to 10 people. You're gonna make two cups. The total time is 20 minutes plus 30 minutes for cooling. Try to buy the smaller berries they have because that gets you the better flavor with the larger, than the larger ones. Quarter in, any berries larger than a ping pong ball. It's important to pull the strawberries from the heat as soon as the mixture begins to bubble and thicken in order to not overcook them. What you need is one half cup, two and one half ounces, or 
Hold on, let me make sure that's one half. My eyes are getting old. Two and one third ounces of sugar. Sorry. So that's one third cup, two and one third ounces of sugar. There we go. One tablespoon cornstarch, pinch table sauce, salt. One fourth cup of water, one pound of strawberries, hold and half or quartered at large. That's about three to three fourth cups. Two teaspoons of lemon juice. You're going to whisk your sugar, your cornstarch, and a salt in a medium saucepan until no lumps of the cornstarch remains. Now you're going to whisk in your water, stir in the strawberries, evenly coated with the sugar mixture. Cook over the medium heat, stirring occasionally until it bubbles. Begin to form around the edge of the saucepan. Mix, the mixture will thicken. That takes about five minutes. Immediately transfer compote to a bowl. Stir in the lemon juice. Mixture will be very thick, but will thin as strawberries sit and continue to release their juice. Let cool completely about 30 minutes. Now you're going to serve. Compote can be refrigerated for up to three days. Now, if you want a strawberry balsamic compote, substitute the one tablespoon balsamic vinegar for the lemon juice. If you want a strawberry basil compote, add five fresh basil leaves to the strawberry mixture with lemon juice and discard the basil before serving. If you want a strawberry lime compote, substitute the one half teaspoon grated lime zest for plus two teaspoons of juice for lemon juice. For a strawberry vanilla compote, substitute one teaspoon vanilla extract for the lemon juice. Okay, and the final thing I want to share with you from this amazing book. It says, well, um, they. I will just do a rough once over here. Become a supermarket sleuth on page 30. We've reviewed thousands of products and made countless discoveries about ingredients along the way. Here's what you need to know to maximize your delicious and ensure your success by Kate Shannon. They have done uh, uh, shopping here uh, and it looks like on the chocolate from the percentages for the pre precision. They have done it on the olive oil, the white chocolate, the sharp cheddar, the canned tuna, block mozzarella, peanut butter, and cocoa powder. And it looks like it's very informative. I, It's very long-winded. And I don't have that much wind, believe it or not. Um, I need to go grab an allergy pill so I can come back to you all, which is unfortunate. I mean, not that I'm coming back to you all, but that my allergies are acting up so bad. Please don't go anywhere. And be sure to pick up this amazing book. It was nice sharing so many tips with you from this cooking book. I hope that one of those recipes have sparked your interest. And maybe this book has encouraged you to go pick up your own copy of Cook's Country from April, May 2021. Thank you and stay right there. Don't go nowhere.